Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, I wanted to talk about CNAP. And what is CNAP? It's another acronym but it is Cloud Native Application Protection Platform. And I want to talk about this mainly because I got confused when I was trying to talk about this with one of my security specialists. And I kind of mixed it up with CSPM and all these other different acronyms that are out there for cloud workload protections, right? So there's CSPM, CWPP, and there's CNAP. And so... We're going to talk about CNAP in general, but we're also going to focus on what Microsoft provides from a CNAP perspective and an overview of the capabilities. And just to preface that, Adam and I both work for Microsoft in our security business. This is something that we typically go over with our customers, but we're going to go over it with a 50,000 foot level overview of all the things that are involved in it. And there's a lot. There is a lot. So CNAP, in general, the idea is to protect your entire platform where applications are being developed. And that could also be part of your DevOps. So it could be application, could be DevOps, but your entire cloud platform from identity logging into the cloud platforms, your hosts like VMs and containers, your databases, SQL databases, storage, your secrets like keys and the code and then the pipelines themselves, your CI, CD pipelines. So all of that encompassing for Microsoft, what we call all of that is Defender for Cloud. And you probably have heard that before, just like with our other branding where the word Defender itself is most of the security things. Purview is our compliance. Entra is our identity. Intune is our endpoint management. Priva is our privacy stuff. Defender for Cloud, it has the word Defender in front of it, but the Defender for Cloud is also an all-encompassing brand that takes care of all of Microsoft's CNAP capabilities. And as part of that, it includes DevSecOps, Cloud Security Posture Management, which is CSPM, and CWPP, your Cloud Workload Protection Platform. You said it well. There's a lot here under the Defender for Cloud umbrella. There isn't really a single product of Defender for Cloud. You can't say, give me Defender for Cloud. There are individual components of Defender for Cloud you can turn on. You can get just as much as you want. You can mix and match. I want this, but not that. There's a lot of flexibility here. The other thing to understand is this is not Azure specific. A lot of these capabilities extend into AWS. A lot of them extend into GCP. And a lot of them even extend into on-premises. For servers that you enroll with Azure Arc, you can extend a lot of Defender for Cloud capabilities to them as well. Obviously, there's some nuance over what can work in AWS, what can work in GCP, what can work in Azure Arc-enabled servers in other clouds or on-premises. But Again, we're just giving the 50,000 foot view today. The other thing to know, uh, as we kind of walk through this, there's another product called Defender for Cloud Apps. This is not that. Those are two different things. Uh, The naming is a bit unfortunate in how close they are together. Defender for Cloud Apps is a SaaS security solution, or the artist formerly known as CASB, Cloud Access Security Broker, that class of product. So we are not talking about Defender for Cloud apps, we're talking about Defender for Cloud. And one final note before we continue, it's not something you go buy a license for either. You don't say, I want 100 Defender for Cloud licenses. Doesn't work that way. You are billed generally based on what you're protecting and how much you're protecting it. So if you want to turn it on these 10 servers, you pay only for the time those servers are up and operational to protect them as one example. So we won't talk about pricing at great length today, but just wanted to clarify a couple of those things. 
highlight that it is not Defender for Cloud Apps, highlight it is not only for Azure, and highlight that it is something that's built on a pay-as-you-go model. The more resources you need to protect, the more you'll pay. And the more those resources do their thing, whether that's uptime for servers or transactions for a database, the billing adjusts accordingly. So with that said, uh, let's talk about DevSecOps. Yeah, so DevSecOps, there used to be something called Defender for DevSecOps. And what that was is Code Pipeline Insights. This is specifically for CICD pipelines where you're protecting applications and resource from code to cloud across multi-pipeline environments like AWS and GCP and Azure. And it will provide you with security findings like infrastructure as code misconfigurations and in and expose secrets that'll help you um, with some insights to prioritize the remediations in the code. One of the things is that Defender for DevOps is now part of CSPM in Defender for Cloud. So one of the confusing things is we've always had CSPM in Defender for Clouds, which is Cloud Security Posture Management. There is now two different flavors of that. There's a foundational one, and then there's a a paid one on top of that, which has additional capabilities. DevSec, uh, Defender for DevOps is now part of that paid portion of Defender for Cloud. In order to take advantage of it, all you got to do is connect your repositories from Azure DevOps, GitHub, or GitLab, and you'll be provided with those code pipeline insights. But again, that subscription that Adam talked about where you're essentially paying as you go, whatever resources that you have connected, you can turn on and off. That subscription has to be enabled for this Defender CSPM paid portion of it in order to take advantage of the Defender for DevOps. Andy, I'm going to put you on the spot here, and it's okay if you don't know the answer. Uh, what is the difference in Defender for DevOps versus GitHub Advanced Security? So, yeah. So Defender for uh, DevOps is more focused on infrastructure as code, CI, CD pipelines. It looks at the CSPM, the posture management of your code as you're deploying those things, you know, as part of your infrastructure as code misconfigurations and maybe secrets that might be part of that. Whereas GitHub advanced security. And to be clear, Adam and I actually don't even work on that portion of our business. Mm -hmm. That's completely sold and, and talked about in a totally different part of our business. But GitHub advanced security is more about the code development itself. And so when you have code in GitHub, it does code scanning. It looks at dependencies that you have within that code. If they're old, it does uh, secret scanning as part of that code as well. But then it has other things like dynamic code review, fuzzing, basically application security, where you're looking at developing applications and not part of your CI CD pipeline where you're developing infrastructure as code. So it's kind of two different things, um, but they're related, but also kind of two different businesses, right? Mm -hmm. They're complementary yeah, yeah, right. in, in, in some scenarios. Um, and yeah, that's a good point. So for those that don't know, uh, Microsoft has some businesses that we run as minimally integrated businesses like LinkedIn and GitHub, where although they're owned by Microsoft, they kind of do their own thing. So GitHub as an example, I believe most of their employees still run uh, on Mac OS. And I think they don't even completely use Microsoft Teams and some other things as well. So they're part of Microsoft, but they do their own thing. So sometimes customers will say, well, what's the difference? And just to clarify, they there are two different teams and really two different companies offering them, but again, very complimentary in terms of what they do. So uh, you, you were right on the spot with the answer. So awesome. And it makes sense though, right? For DevSecOps, you're thinking mm -hmm. about Azure infrastructure and doing like ARM templates and deploying that to Azure, right? Where you're just clicking a button and it's deploying, you know, VMs or whatever infrastructure that you're deploying uh, without having to do the little drop downs, right? Whereas like GitHub Advanced Security, you're actually writing code for apps, 
where you right. you have dependencies. So um, related things, but also different different businesses. So for security posture, we kind of talked about this already, but there is multi-cloud coverage, AWS, Azure, and GCP. And I think one of the biggest things, Adam, you talked about the Arc-enabled servers. Now, Arc-enabled servers, there's an agent that is installed on a server, and that provides insight back to Azure so that you can see um, if you onboard it with Defender for Cloud vulnerabilities, you can install Defender for Endpoint, all these different things, right, as part of Defender for Cloud, extending those capabilities to on-prem servers. That used to be the way to do it as well for AWS and GCP. Now, for AWS and GCP, you can do agentless. And instead of having to deploy an ARC agent onto servers, you're essentially hooking up on the back end via an API to that AWS account or to the GCP, whatever they use. I'm not a GCP expert, but essentially similar to an Azure subscription or AWS account and hooking that in. And so everything that is associated with that, say AWS account will then get onboarded to Defender for Cloud and, and therefore have all the capabilities. So no agent required now for those um, areas. For on-prem still requires an agent currently. And, and the point here is Microsoft announced within the last year or so that our security business has grown to be a $20 billion business annually. It's a big deal. And I mentioned in one of our previous shows how our leader of all security engineering, Charlie Bell, sits on the senior leadership team and reports directly to CEO Satya Nadella. The answer is Microsoft is a security company. Security is a big deal to Microsoft today. It is a huge business. Microsoft is a hyperscale cloud infrastructure provider that is also a security company. And Amazon is not a security company. Google has some security bona fides for sure with the Mandiant acquisition, but it's still a relatively small part of their business comparatively speaking. And so our goal here is to make the Defender for Cloud environment can be the center of all of your cloud infrastructure security operations across any of those clouds against on-premises, against even servers in third-party clouds. You could have stuff in Oracle Cloud. If it's onboarded with Azure Arc, you can see it. If it's in IBM Cloud, if it's onboarded with Azure Arc, you can still see it. So you can go to one place and have that holistic view across all of it. And that's really the difference is because we're a very serious security company, we wanted to offer that one-stop shop to protect all of your cloud infrastructure, even if you're not doing business with us. And as part of that CSPM, very familiar secure score will be a part of it, right? So you have secure score for Defender, you have your purview secure score, but here you have your Defender for cloud secure score, which will give you things like, you know, do you have VMs with external IPs exposed to the internet, you know, port, 22 um, exposed to the internet on servers. So stuff like that to help you improve your security posture. As part of the paid per version, there's also an attack path analysis. We talked about that on some previous shows where you can literally see how an attacker would use vulnerabilities within your environment to attack you. So you can use that as intel to help you shore up your defenses. There's also governance tools built in. So any uh, compliance framework that you are required to uh, comply with, you essentially can get some insights on what parts of the, your cloud posture is compliant or non-compliant and then help remediate that. Like I had a customer ask, you know, this was like in Australia. They're like, hey, we have some data privacy, Australian compliance regulation. And I went to Defender for Cloud and looked up, you know, Australian. I just started typing Australian and there it was. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact regulation, but there's hundreds of regulations there that you can essentially scope against your environment and then get insights on, on whether or not you're compliant or not. And then identity. Identity being a big part of multi-cloud environment. We have enter permissions management, which is our 
uh, um, CIEM, Cloud Identity Entitlement Management. Did I say that right? Cloud Infrastructure Entitlement Management. You were close. Thanks. There's a lot of acronyms tonight. <laughs> so many acronyms. But Enter Permissions Management essentially was our Cloud Knox acquisition a few years ago. And it was a, a separate portal, and there was some onboarding that had to be done there. But the idea is to look at permissions within different cloud environments and see what identities are over permission, how often they're used, whether or not they need to be with recommendations to kind of pare it down to more least privileged uh, users. That actually is now part of Defender CSPM. And so those over permissioned alerts and capabilities are going to be integrated into Defender CSPM, which is again, that paid portion. Um, the foundational part of it if you're familiar with CSPM in general, the foundational part of it includes a lot of things. It includes the compliance. It includes, um, you know, whether or not you're, you have open ports or IP addresses that are external, stuff like that, right? Like that's all part of the foundational one. The attack path analysis, um, now this um, enter permissions management, and also that what we talked about before, the Defender for DevOps, that's all part of like the paid portion of it, which is just on top of the foundational. But um, yeah, so that's, that's all going to be part of it. Yeah, and so one thing to note, and Andy, I think you just covered this, but I want to emphasize this point, is there has been the foundational posture management capabilities in Defender for Cloud for many years now, going back to when it was Azure Defender or Azure Security Center. If you remember those previous brands, it's been in there forever. I want to be clear. None of that has been taken away. None of that has been plucked out and moved into a paid offering. What happened was we have developed net new capabilities and that is now available for a nominal fee if you want to add in those additional capabilities. Now, what I'm impressed with, as I've talked through this with Andy, and we're still digesting some of those announcements from Ignite, is that we have built more value into that without increasing the cost. So essentially now, Defender for DevOps is included in CSPM. The Entra Permissions Management is effectively included in Defender CSPM. That's that paid version of it. So more value is being included at no additional cost to you. If you are already using it, you just get more. And that's really awesome. And so to take something that was previously a separate product with a separate dashboard and a separate view, and now integrating those alerts and those insights into that same view, into that same dashboard, super valuable because Having alerts or insights in another dashboard means it's another thing to go check, another thing to go look at, and maybe another thing to forget. But if it's right in line with everything else, you can say, oh, gosh, yeah, uh, that administrator is way over permission. Let's go fix that right now. And you're viewing that right in line with some of the other things Andy talked about. These ports are open. This is uh, not up to date on patches. This is an insecure configuration for externally facing IP addresses. Having all of that together just makes sense. And so this is an awesome announcement, bringing that all in one place. Yeah. And then we have another one called Defender for API. And this is again, one of those other things that you can toggle on or off, but it gives you a complete aggregated view of all managed APIs you can analyze different security findings, information of external unused or unauthenticated APIs. You can ingest API traffic and monitor it with runtime anomaly detection and you know, use machine learning or rule-based analytics to detect any security threats, including the OWASP API top 10 critical threats. So if you're using APIs or want to keep track of APIs and how they're being used, Defender for API is a, another great solution for you there. I think that's an area that's really growing in interest. I had a former CISO that I used to work for or work with, maybe it's a better way to put it, who had left to go to a startup that was solely focused on API security. And I'm sure they have a great product, but he's talking about the risks there and they are significant. Well, here's another 
defender that you can enable with the flip of a switch and start to protect against. And I think it's an area folks should continue to look at. And as part of our announcements from Ignite, the, the big one being that Sentinel and M365 Defender, now Defender XDR, are being integrated into one comprehensive portal just under the Defender Security Center. You might ask how these alerts are coming through for Defender for Cloud. Traditionally, under Defender for Cloud within Azure, there is its own Azure uh, security alerts that are being populated within there. And of course, you can go to that and look at all the alerts. And for many years now, there's a one-click integration into Sentinel, or you can export them to a different SIM via an API as well. That was the only way that there used to be, a, you know, kind of a, uh, a triage area for your investigations. But there's also now an integration with the Defender XDR Security Center. So you're not only going to get your Sentinel alerts, you're also going to get your Defender for Cloud stuff there, and, of course, all of your M365 Defender as well. So I think just your comprehensive SOC center that you have all of your security alerts are just going to be funneled right into there. Um, so, you know, that's, that's another cool thing. <laughs> it's so funny how that was a under the radar announcement because normally that would be a huge deal. And in light of everything else going on, it was just a bullet point on there. Like, Oh yeah, we're inter integrating defender for cloud in the broader uh, defender XDR plus defender for Microsoft Sentinel environment. And it was, again, just a bullet. And that's a huge freaking deal because now across both your kind of end user facing environment, as well as your infrastructure, as well as your SIM, which covers your broader environment, it's all in one place. It's, I think for security defenders, it's going to be just huge. Now let's talk about the cloud workload protection platform that's within Azure. So you have, starting with the big one, cloud servers, right? Defender for servers. So again, Defender for servers is part of the overall Defender for Cloud brand. It is something that Adam and I talk probably the most with our customers with because we talk endpoints and servers a lot. Mm -hmm. There w was and still is an old way to license servers for Defender for Endpoint if you are a Defender for Endpoint customer. The main thing is, is that when you go to the Defender for Cloud model as part of the cloud infrastructure, a lot of companies try to save money by spinning down servers or spinning them up. And with Defender for Cloud, you're only paying for that monthly license as long as that server is up. If it's down, you're not going to pay for it. Versus the licensing, the old legacy model, you're kind of paying a flat fee and you're getting that Defender for Endpoint for servers and you just pay that regardless of whether or not that server is up or down. So Defender for Cloud in general is a better model, especially for the more modern companies that have infrastructure as code. You're, you have downtime for servers that are spinning down during hours of um, where it, you know your business is not um, at its peak. So as part of Defender for Servers, you're going to get that Defender for Endpoint protection. You're also going to get things like just-in-time network access, file integrity monitoring, and vulnerability assessments. And again, this is available for on-prem or in the cloud across all the different multi-cloud environments like AWS and GCP. Yeah, love that pricing model. As you talked about, Andy, customers modernize and, and run servers minimally. You only pay for what you use. And just to be clear, the the per license model where you, you pay that flat licensing fee, you add it to your enterprise agreement, that cost is effectively the same as running a Defender for Cloud server protection 24-7, 365. Or I guess I should say 24-7, 30 um, in that case. But it, it, it washes out to be the same. So if you're running it anything less than full time, that pay as you go model is going to save you money. We also have a defender for storage. So that is more for like your uh, structured data, like, like, like storage uh, databases. And you can look at 
either harmful attempts to access or exploit your storage accounts. And then it also has some advanced threat detection capabilities that are built in to provide you with some security alerts. The databases themselves, like Azure SQL database. So when I actually researched this, like there's already a lot of Defender products here. Hmm. There were even more than I actually knew about. So (laughs) just in the database alone, there's Defender for Azure SQL database, Defender for SQL servers on machines, Defender for open source relational, relational databases, and Defender for Azure Cosmos DB. I mean, that's a lot right there. I don't know what all of them do, but my assumption is just in general, they protect your database estate with attack detection, threat response, that sort of thing. So, I mean, they're, essentially, if you have databases, we have a defender for it. The other one is defender for containers. And so this used to be two different ones. And we've actually consolidated, reduced one Defender. So it used to be Defender for Container Registries and Defender for Kubernetes. Now it's one Defender for Containers, and that includes containers and Kubernetes. And so you're able to improve and monitor the security of your clusters, your container, the registry images, applications with um, environment hardening, vulnerability assessments, and runtime protection. And so, you know, when you're deploying those registries, whether they're out of date, um, if they're over permissioned within the containers host, all of that is part of Defender for Containers. I actually watched an hour long video. And if you're not aware of this, we have the security community videos on YouTube that are free and they're recorded and you can go and watch them. They're actually really, really good. And they're headed up by our product group folks who essentially are super smart and really deep on one thing and they know the roadmap, they know all the features. And I watched an hour long video just on Defender for Containers. And just to give you an idea, they were able to fill a whole hour on just Defender for Containers. <laughs> so we're literally going over the highlights of what this stuff is. But if you wanted like a deep dive, you know, go and look up one of those videos because it's super informative. And I learned a lot because I didn't know what it all protected and you know how kubernetes worked and how containers work they actually went through like 30 minutes of what a container is and how it's deployed and all the different minutia details of using containers in kubernetes so i um, super impressed with that and then of course uh, you have some infrastructure service insights so you're able to diagnose weaknesses in your application infrastructure that can leave your environment susceptible to attack. So there's Defender for App Service, Defender for Key Vault, Defender for Resource Manager, which is the Azure Resource Manager, and then the Defender for DNS. And so those are some infrastructure service that, you know, if, if you use that within Azure, those are things that can help you protect that. And then finally, I had a little bullet note, but Adam, you jumped the gun with (laughs) GitHub Advanced Security, which again is kind of the offshoot of it. So that's literally the code part of it versus the infrastructure part of it, which is more the CNAP part. CNAP doesn't necessarily, I guess it does include the code, but in Microsoft we have, you know, the code kind of separated off in that other company, but it is, it obviously has a ton of integration with Azure. Wow, that was a lot to cover. Just keep in mind as you sift through all of this that Defender for Cloud, again, it's that overarching brand and it's CSPM and it's CNAP and it's CWPP. It's all of the things under that brand, but you can enable all of these on a per workload basis under a subscription. And if you want to get even more granular than that, you can move resources under different subscriptions. So you can uh, maybe enable like a, a P1 on this subscription and a P2 on that subscription. So for example, Defender for Servers has a P1 and P2 flavor. If you want to deploy both, you can put all the ones that are P1 in one subscription, all the P2 in another subscription, and you can turn on both. But any of these workloads can be turned on on a workload by workload basis. So you can review what they do if you need them, and then you can enable them as you need them. And turning it on is literally as easy as flipping a switch. So if you say, hey, I've looked at 
Defender for databases and all the different types Andy talked about between Cosmos DB and SQL and open source relational databases. And you're like, yes, I want that. Flip a switch. And now you're protecting all your databases. And so the ease of deployment here is unmatched. Uh, look at the premium CSPM capabilities because more is being added to that all the time as evidence from Ignite where things like the CloudNox capabilities have been built into it now. So uh, lots of stuff here, lots of things to dig through in the show notes. We'll link all of it, but some really good things to be aware of as you move more stuff into the cloud, you want to protect it. And my advice to customers is do Defender by default. If you move a workload to Azure, just include running the Defender for it as part of the cost of doing business. That way, you know you're protected. You know you're getting the best alerts. You know you're being alerted to anomalies. And you don't have to do any extra work because you just flip the switch and it's enabled. So lots of really great stuff in Defender for Cloud. This is something I have to say. When I first came responsible for covering this product now, uh, almost two and a half years ago, I at the time said, I don't, I don't get it. It's very fragmented. The story isn't holistic. I see the value in it, but it's hard to articulate it to customers. It's hard to explain what this is, what it does. And although there's still a lot here, I think the story has gotten a lot better because it is holistic now. It does cover everything. It's going to give you those security posture alerts. It's going to dynamically protect all the things. And it's so comprehensive now across all the resource types you generally see in cloud infrastructure or even cloud paths that it's, it's all there. You just have to decide if it's something you want to enable. Yeah. And you mentioned the subscriptions, which is how you basically get charged for things. And if you don't have anything within that and you toggle it, you're not going to get charged. So for example, in my demo environment, I have all the switches turned on, but I don't have any Azure Cosmos DBs or <laughs> key any key vaults. You know, I don't have any of those. I don't even have a storage account, but I have Defender for Storage turned on. And so if you don't have any of those, you turn them on, you're going to get charged zero. Mm -hmm. So it's pay as you go, the resources that are associated with that subscription. The one main limitation, like Adam mentioned, is you can only have one thing enabled and you have to protect all the things. So like, let's say you have 50 as um, SQL databases and they're on one subscription. If you turn on Defender for SQL, it's going to protect all 50. You can't say, I only want to protect 20. If you only want to protect 20, you got to move those 20 to a different subscription because it's enabled per the subscription. Same thing with Defender for Servers. There's the P1, P2 flavor. If you have 100 servers on one subscription and you turn on Defender for Servers P2, it's going to protect all 100. If you want to separate it out, you got to move them to a different subscription. So it is enabled at the subscription level, and whatever resources fall within that particular Defender all gets covered. Absolutely. And that can be the, both the challenge and the opportunity makes it real easy to deploy. But if you want to do a more complex deployment, you just need to move stuff between subscriptions, which is not the end of the world for sure. Um, it, it's, I would say for our listeners who are security defenders by and large, you want all the things protected. So I love your call out, Andy. If you go flip all the switches and if you're not using that thing today, if somebody spins it up tomorrow, then it's just the cost of doing business. Hey, you want to put this in Azure? Okay, it costs this much. And it's both the cost of running the infrastructure or the PaaS offering plus the Defender for offering. And that's just the price you quote your internal customers at your company. And I, I'd say that's a great model to go because it's so simple. And then everything's just protected and done with, and you don't have to come back later and go find more budget or anything else. You're gonna protect it incrementally as you build it out. And I think as a lot of companies are still doing, or even just starting their cloud migrations from their on-prem data centers, if you have this just baked into your cost model from the get-go, it's a heck of a lot easier than trying to come back and put it on later. So some really great call-outs there. 
And the final thing I'll add, obviously, we're coming at this with a very heavy Microsoft view because Adam and I work for Microsoft, as well as this is what we know. Mm -hmm. We're we're in this business, and so we understand the offerings that we have here. CNAP is agnostic across the board. There's other companies that offer CNAP solutions. I know Palo Alto has a CNAP solution. Wiz. Rapid 7. W yep. Wiz mm -hmm. is another big one. Um, and, of course, if you're a big AWS shop, Azure or AWS has their own native security as well. Mm -hmm. It's confusing to me, so I won't even try to talk about it. But they do have things to protect their own workloads. Mm -hmm. When we mention that it's multi-cloud environments, mainly we talk about it like if you're – majority Azure and then maybe you do an acquisition or something like that or M and a, and you have to protect that workload and they don't have any security, right? It, it is multi-cloud um, and cloud environment agnostic across the board. So, but obviously if you're majority AWS, you may not use something like this. You may use the AWS portion of it. I don't know if the AWS stuff will protect Azure that I don't know. But I will tell you that Azure Defender for Cloud will be able to protect the AWS stuff. Right. Yep. Big part of our story is being that multi-cloud, uh, even hybrid cloud on-premises capabilities here. That's that's really important. So as opposed to being a effort to try to bring everybody over to Azure, and believe me, yeah, we'd love everybody to run everything on Azure. Uh, we recognize that we want to meet customers where they are. And a lot of customers are committed to a multi-cloud strategy to diversify their risk or as a mandate from their board or whatever. And we'd like to give them at least that single pane of glass to protect it. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and listening as always. We'll have a lot of links in the show notes if you want to do a deep dive and read about all the different Defender products, maybe something piqued your interest. Find the link in the show notes. I will populate all of them for you as well as our contact information will be there if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.